600 million witnesses, 8 million pounds of thrust, 400,000 engineers, 250,000 miles, and three astronauts, all leading up to one small step. And here we are, 50 years later, asking one of humanity's greatest questions. What is our next giant leap? And I'll give you a hint, it's not Mars. It's been 50 years since we've proven the impossible possible. Human beings with their own two feet, standing on another rock in space. But we didn't just do it once, we did it five more times. The Apollo program was a way for us to better understand space phenomena like moonquakes and solar winds, but it also paved the way for humans to fly further, to explore what lies beyond the Earth and the Moon. But we haven't gone further. At least, yet. After Apollo 17 in 1972, NASA canceled Apollos 18, 19, and 20. Why? We ran out of money. Hey! This is my Wally! So we know why we haven't gone back, but the question is why did we go in the first place? Let's be real. President Kennedy didn't give his iconic speech in 1961 because going to the moon was cool. The United States simply wanted to teach our neighbor, Sergey a good old fashioned American lesson. Isn't that right, Eddie Whistler? Absolutely. We needed to teach them a lesson. They were first in space with a satellite, first in space with an animal, first in space with a man, uh, first in space to go into outer space with a woman as well. And so the United States was going to have none of it, especially since these things were altered war weapons. It was tension. So to answer your question, yes, that's why we started the Apollo program. After proving to the Soviet Union that we could go to the moon, and do it again and again, the space race was pretty much over. We haven't been to the moon since then, but it's not like we stopped space exploration altogether. In 1976, just four years after Apollo 17, NASA rolled out a concept for a reusable spaceship named by a bunch of Star Trek nerds that would begin a new era of human spaceflight, Space Shuttle Enterprise. Looks uh, just beautiful here. While Enterprise was only used for test flights here on Earth, five other space shuttles were built and flew missions to space from 1981 all the way up to 2011. The space shuttles were like semi-trucks that made deliveries to Earth orbit, things like the Hubble telescope, as well as bits and pieces of what we know of today as the International Space Station. So the question is, why did we stop? We had reusable space flight for 30 years. Dude! What the Falcon 9? This reusable rocket built by SpaceX can be launched for just $62 million. That's right, folks, for just $62 million, you can launch up to 55,000 pounds to low Earth orbit. Something that the space shuttles did for over $450 million per launch. Now that's a way to break the bank. Buy now and get two, two Falcon, Falcon first stages free. free! This Falcon Heavy configuration has not once, not twice, but three times more power than the Falcon 9. It could even take humans to Mars! <laughs> it's a rocket palooza! Now, hold on, Lee. Weren't we supposed to be telling them why Mars isn't the next giant Lee? I was getting there, but whatever, just tell them. Don't forget what we talked about so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's important yeah, for later. Yeah. Trust me. When human beings land on Mars sometime in the 2030s, it just won't have the same impact that it did when we landed on the moon. Think about it this way. If you traveled into the future, 500 years into the future, and asked your great, 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 great granddaughter what one event got her to living on Mars, what would that event be? Go ahead and lock in your answers now. Time's up. All right, everybody, say it with me now. The French Revolution! What? The, the French Revo- Where did you guys even get- That's like the wrongest answer anyone could have come up with. The correct answer, in theory, is Apollo 11. Now, some of you might be thinking that the first humans on Mars might be more significant, but Apollo 11 was the first time anyone ever in the history of the human race left our rock and walked on another. It was the first time the impossible had happened, and it opened up an entire universe for us to explore. Literally. Uh, yes ma'am, you had a question? If Mars isn't the next giant leap then, what is? Oh, Emily, yeah, it's, it's nice to see you again. Are you here to embarrass me again, like you did in front of our kids? This isn't about us, Lee. I just want to move on. 
The past is the past. Haven't you thought about that? Actually, as a matter of fact, this is about us. It's about all of us. No matter where you're from, no matter where you live, the next giant leap is us. Oh. I don't get it. Let me just show you. Whoosh. Our generation is going to be recognized for something truly amazing. Commercial space travel. Nearly 60 years ago, we proved that humans could survive in the vacuum of space, but here we are now. Most of us still haven't gone. So where am I headed to with this airplane? Well, let's just say that the future of space exploration could be hiding in your own backyard. Welcome to Cecil Spaceport, where we're witnessing the birth of space commercialization. On a general aviation map, this place actually has the same rocket operation symbol as Kennedy Space Center. But that's pretty much all I know about this place. But I think I know someone that can tell us a little bit more. This is Todd Lindner, the director of Cecil Spaceport. He told me that the field was created in 1942 as a Navy base. And while there's still military and civilian flight training going on, this little airport in the middle of nowhere might serve another purpose in the coming years. So has anything been launched from here yet? We have not done a commercial launch. We have done uh, a couple of test operations. We've done some hot fire testing. The first real commercial launch is actually scheduled uh, for spring of 2020 now. The whole idea of a spaceport, you know, we used to think that we have to go to Kennedy Space Center to see a rocket launch, and now, you know, we're launching from California, from, you know, all over the world, essentially, and soon, you know, where I live, Jacksonville. So do you think, um, this idea of you know, commercial space travel is going to expand? I think the Jacksonville Cecil Spaceport will probably reach a point in time when the two operations, the aviation side and the commercial space side, will probably come together. As we move forward, uh, a couple of issues that we are trying to address both here locally and in, at the national global level is how does commercial space transportation impact uh, the airspace and what effect does it have on airline transportation and once those issues are resolved and once we see and understand uh, how these vehicles will operate in the same airspace I think that will answer a lot of questions and allow for the, uh, the two operations to move forward together and at that point in time I think you'll see spaceport and airport really have an opportunity to come together as one. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm afraid we've solved the case. But whether you're planning on raising a family on Mars or spending a weekend on the International Space Station, once all of this becomes a reality, we need to work on making it more accessible so that everyone can enjoy the wonders of the universe without breaking the bank. Are you kidding me? Hey YouTube, it's Lee from Flying Ostrich. If you liked what you saw, like this video, leave us a comment, and of course, subscribe if you want to see more aviation, more science, more space, more short films, more chickens, and much, much more giveaways and contests and all that fun stuff is definitely coming soon. So we hope you can join us. And of course, yeah, what she said.